Hello, everyone. I'm Tommy Waller. I am a Christian Zionist, and I head an organization called High Yovel, a volunteer organization here in Israel. And I am Kimberly Traub. I, too, am a Christian Zionist, and I am the U.S. Director of Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. And I'm Sandra Ostraveris. I am an Orthodox Jew, and I run the Israel Office of Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. Welcome to the program today. We're going to be talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, and actually that is a holiday that's coming up. And, you know, we all have different perspectives on this feast, but I want to just kind of step in here and start um, how do Jews celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles? And of course, answering that question really takes us straight to the Bible. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, or as we refer to it in Hebrew, Sukkot, is mentioned in the Bible in a few different places. Um, in Leviticus 23, where we have a list of a lot of different holidays, we have uh, mentioning as follows, um, on the first day, you shall take the product of a of a citrus fruit tree, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And then a few verses later, you shall live in booths seven days. All citizens shall live in booths in order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, the Hebrew word for the holiday, Sukkot, is actually the word that's used in these verses for booths, or you could say hots or whatever. And this really is, um, these, these verses that I mentioned here uh, are really the key customs of the holiday. Um, we leave our homes uh, our comfortable homes, you know, with its permanent walls and its heating or its air conditioning, uh, protection yes. from the elements. And we go out and we live in this very temporary structure. It can be made out of uh, wood panels. It can be made out of canvas or really any, any kind of temporary product. Um, and the key, though, is that it cannot have a real roof. Uh, the top of it is going to be some type of branches or uh, palm branches. or You know, there's a number of different ways to, to, to cover it or, or bamboo. People use bamboo poles or bamboo mats. But the key to this is that it is not a real roof in the sense that you are not protected from the elements. Uh, you have a bit of shade, perhaps, but you're still going to get some of the sunlight. And if it does rain, which it usually does, doesn't, but if it would rain, you know, you'd get wet. All right. So that's a key element. We, and we, we actually, most people eat their meals in this hut, which we call in Hebrew a sukkah. Um, but some people also sleep in, in that, in that hut, in that sukkah. Um, of course, all of these customs are much easier to fulfill in the land of Israel. And if there's ever, if there ever was um, a proof that God meant for the Jewish people to be in the land of Israel, it's looking at this holiday. Because I remember growing up in Cleveland, we, of course, Jews all over the world keep all of these holidays as well. But imagine putting up a, um, a flimsy structure in uh, late September, early October in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, it always rained. On occasion, it snowed. Um, and so, and of course, if it is raining or snowing, you're not, you don't have to sit in this, in this structure. You go inside. Um, God doesn't want us to get the flu, uh, or pneumonia, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that in the scripture here. It doesn't say you have to, you can go inside. <laughs> it actually says right. you have to, v'nishmata me'od l'nafshotechem, you have to look out very much for your health. So, you know, oh, oh, is that where? Okay. That is going to not the English the scripture for that. But that always takes precedence if something is going to risk you. Oh, but anyway, gotcha. this right. this is not, you know, on occasion it may rain in Israel for like a few hours on Sukkot and and it's a warm rain and you just run in and then you run back out. And, you know, it's really not a big deal. But most of the time it doesn't rain. Anyway, so that's that's that part of it. And the other thing is taking these different um, branches. You take this, um, actually the way it's done, you take the, 
the center of the palm, a palm branch is like the center of the spine of it. Um, and you attach to it um, some a myrtle, uh, some sprigs of this myrtle branches, and you have some uh, willow branches. And then you take this citrus fruit that's not a lemon. It's, the, it's a fruit that's called uh, an etrog. Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's translated to be a citron. It is mm -hmm. inedible. Okay, it's extremely sour, although there are people who make jelly out of it, mm. uh, preserves of some kind. But um, it's really, it's grown for this purpose. Mm. Uh, and we put them all together and it becomes a very important part of the holiday. Every day in the synagogue, we take this, these branches and, and, and the citron and we, we hold it together, we take it to the synagogue and there's a part of the, of the service where we read the Hallel which is um, a, a number of uh, psalms. Uh, and those, the purpose of those psalms is to praise God and to thank God and to, to really glorify God. And, and, and all of the three pilgrimage festivals, um, that prayer, the hallel prayer, is a very, very central part of the prayer. And when you mm -hmm. celebrate on Sukkot, you take the, the branches with you and you are marching around the synagogue waving them and it's really really a sight to see and it's it's just it's just fabulous and um so these are the two two main uh things that we do and and the reason that we see here in um in leviticus the end is is that why are we doing all this why are we sitting in the sukkah as a reminder of the experience of the nation of israel uh, when they came out of Egypt and they spent those years in the desert, that they too were living in this kind of temporary hut-like thing. And, and you know, if you think about it, though, um, I'm sure that actually in the desert, they probably had more like tents, okay? And their tents probably had more protection from the elements than a sukkah does. But... Um, the, the idea here really is not to have exactly the kind of dwelling they live in, but to replicate the experience. And if you remember, um, we learn many, many times in scripture that uh, God had this, the clouds uh, of glory uh, over mm -hmm. the camp mm -hmm. uh, and the clouds of glory over the tabernacle and, and the clouds of glory that shield the camp as they march. Um, and so, this whole idea of, of going out into a sukkah that is open to the elements is supposed to replicate this, I, this experience the nation of Israel had where they knew they went into a desert. Nobody goes into a desert. Nobody takes a whole nation into a desert. You don't know where you're going to find water. You don't know the, the scorching sun. You don't know what you're dealing with, snakes and enemies and I don't know what, uh, you know, bandits, etc. Um, and, and what enabled them to do that was because they had this cloud of glory. It wasn't a cloud. It was the representation of God's protection. And so when we go out from our very stable homes into a sukkah each year for a week, what we're doing is experiencing the vulnerability of the nation, but at the same time, the need to be totally reliant on God. And, and I, if you're going to ask me, what is the overriding theme of Sukkot? It's that. And there's something thrilling about it. To, to especially in modern days, we have very strong houses. And, you know, these days our houses are built to withstand uh, earthquakes and to withstand tornadoes. And, and, we, and we have, you know, storm windows. And we have all these things that we've added to our houses to, to make us feel more and more and more protected. And once a year we, we realize none of this is relevant because we are truly at the mercy of God's protection and spend a week in a sukkah and you'll really feel that. And it will really uplift you because you'll realize that it is God who really is looking over us and it's our protection. And if you ask me, if I had to choose between who am I going to rely on God or some bricks, I think God wins hands down. Hands down. So that's <laughs> in a nutshell, you know, Amen. the celebration of sukkah, but you know, Kim, I know as a Christian, you know these verses backwards and forwards, but what do they mean to you, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and these verses? Well, I just have a quick question and then I'll talk about me. But um, so is there a specific relevance or what's the the purpose behind, not not the purpose, because you say you, you um, 
bow them before the Lord. But is there a significance behind the date palm and the myrtle and the citron and the whatever the other one is? Well, the Bible never tells us why. Oh, okay. It doesn't. Okay. That's why. But it says you should take these things and then rejoice before the Lord your God. So these are seen okay. as vehicles of rejoicing. So at the simplest level, um, these are uh, agricultural products of the land of Israel. Okay. Um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is at the end of, of what has been months of harvesting and gathering fruits and you know, Tommy and Iovel is all involved now with bringing in the grapes right. and there's all these different things. So the idea of bringing um, these various agricultural products and putting them together and its most basic level, I think that's something that's representing the joy of the harvest. But over the years, many people have um, found symbolism. And, and one of the most um, commonly um, Sim, a common symbolism that people refer to in this is, and they talk about the each of these have different levels of smell and taste. Oh. Um, the palm, well, not the palm branch itself, but the dates that come off the palm branch, okay, are, are very, very sweet uh, and they have a good smell. The um, citron fruit has a very good smell, but mm. not much in the way of taste. Uh, the myrtle, um, has no i'm getting this mixed up now anyway i always get mixed up the willow has nothing no smell no taste okay right um, but the myrtle does smell good the myrtle smells good so the yeah. myrtle must be smell without taste and okay. maybe the palm is no yeah, right the dates don't smell but they have good taste, taste. and okay. the citron has taste i don't particularly like it taste and <laughs> smell smell okay? okay so the idea being it's it's bringing all kinds of people together Okay, ah. people that have good deeds and people that have bad deeds and people that have nothing to, to you know, nothing to to to, to show for themselves, uh, and you have all these people with different qualities, negative qualities and and positive qualities, and people that on its face are just wonderful. They do it all, and people on its face that do nothing, and, but you're bringing them all together as a symbolic way of saying when we all come together. Mm. then we are all have value and we praise God together. And I think that that's just a beautiful, beautiful um, sentiment. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, for me, I was trying to remember, like, did I know about, you know, growing up in a Christian home, growing up in church all my life, did I, had I ever heard of the Feast of Tabernacles? Certainly not Sukkot, but had I ever heard that term? And I honestly, I don't know because I do know I grew up in a home that was, you know, very um, Phileo Jewish, I guess you would say Phileo Hebrew roots. So we definitely talked about uh, the different festivals and the different feasts, but I don't know that I even began to understand it. Um, my first trip to Israel, however, was during it was for specifically for. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles um, in 1998. And so seeing that and, you know, for anyone that's been there, which uh, the ICEJ has done a tremendous job over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. I don't even know when they started way back in the 80s somewhere, but they began a Christian version of the Feast of Tabernacles just, I think, to educate Christians and just to expose them to this idea of here we have Jews that for thousands of years since Moses wrote it in Exodus, really, or, or what was it, Leviticus, wherever it was written that every year you're going to celebrate this, Jews have been following that commandment and have been obedient to that commandment, whether they were, you know, in the shuttles of Russia. That's what I always think of. I always think, oh, my God, how did they do this in Russia? <laughs> you know, like when it's in late snow. September, right, you know, when there's a feet of snow, you're like, how did they survive? They had lots of hot chocolate or something. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, no matter where they were, that for thousands and thousands of years, no matter where they were dispersed to the ends of the earth, they still followed the Bible. They still read these commandments and they did them and they've preserved this tradition and, and have continued it. So I think that was really what the Feast of Tabernacles was birthed out of. And then I think they also um, have the scripture in Zechariah, uh, chapter 14, verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year 
to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. So the Feast of Booths is clearly speaking of uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Um, I don't know. In Hebrew, is that scripture? Does it say Sukkot? It probably yeah, does. Sure. Okay. Sukkot. So Sukkot. So it is Sukkot. Um, so it's definitely one in the same. So again, it's that idea and that concept that there are three feasts, correct, that Jews are commanded to, to follow every single year to come to Jerusalem and to worship. And this is one of them. Um, I think it's also so. So seeing that, I mean, my experience is coming into Jerusalem. Every restaurant has a Sukkah. Um, every house, you know, and it doesn't matter how secular the people are. It doesn't matter how, you know, they've never set foot in synagogue, you know, but they build a sukkah. You know, it's so ingrained in them that we go back and we remember 6,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago that God delivered us from Egypt. Um, I don't know. You probably have never seen it, Sandra. Tommy might have. VeggieTales did a VeggieTales version of the Exodus and the the way that they portray crossing the desert is the the children of Israel step out on the sand and it's like burning hot, you know, like it's it's like blistering. And then the cloud comes over, and where the cloud comes over, it sprinkles down snow. And so they walk in snow through this blistering desert. It, it's a great visual of that protection and and that, you know, because I think as Christians, I don't think that we recognize or real I mean I know that I certainly didn't um put much emphasis or focus on the fact that you know it was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day and it never left. Right. You know, and so the the veggie tales they do a great job of like really um making that an image where this cloud right. goes over them by day and this fire by night that keeps them warm in the desert and, and, and that protection and that whole thing. So just this whole concept of, you know, what are Christians doing celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles? And, and why are we partaking in this? Uh, I think that it is always good to worship God. It's always good to remember that God is a keeper of promises. And that's, to me, really what the Feast of Tabernacles is about, um, is just seeing that. Um, and, and just the whole festive, you know, the other part of it, which you didn't really talk about, is, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles is like the culmination of what we call the high holy days that begin at Rosh Hashanah and then go into, you know, Yom Kippur, which is like the, the day of atonement, the day of fasting, the day of mourning. It's just like a really serious, serious day. Well, it's and, not a day of mourning. It's oh, it's not, not a day of mourning, but it's a day of fasting. It's a day of fasting, but it, unlike fast days that are affiliated with mourning, this is a fast day of purification. Ah, okay. Uh, the idea to, to purify yourself and come before God in your most pure way. Um, and, you know, so you haven't dealt with food, you haven't dealt with drink, you haven't, mm. you know, there's other things, you know, that you're doing. Is that, is that the, Sandra, is that the same as detox? You know, <laughs> it is. is that it? Detox, you know? No, 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 no. No, it's not. Okay, sorry. Just just want to clarify in case people get that. <laughs> but, you know, that, but you're right. And I'll tell you something that's very interesting. You're right. I didn't mention it. There's just so many layers here that, that we could get into. But what I did mention was the um, um, the agricultural element. All the right. pilgrimage festivals in the Bible have a historical element and they have a um, an agricultural element. So one of the things that... Um, that became customary. You don't, you don't see it mentioned in the Bible, but this was how it was celebrated uh, in ancient Israel. Was um, it was a time when you would, when we believed that God would determine on the Feast of Tabernacles how much water we would get. Now, in oh, ancient wow. times, how much water you got, how much rain you got, could be the difference between life and death. For sure, and, drought and none. And, Right. And, and so that was that was very key. So and this was the time because the the rainy season in Israel begins after the Feast of Tabernacles. We have no right. rain. And in fact, typically the, the rainy season begins after the Feast of Tabernacles and ends before Passover. Right. OK, so the Feast of Tabernacles, in fact, today, the last day of the holiday, uh, we say a special prayer for rain. Mm -hmm. And in the times of the temple, they would have these special um, celebrations where they would bring water. They would go down to the Shiloh, which is the spring way down in the valley uh, below the temple. They would the high priest would go down there 
and and draw water from the from the Gihon or from the Shiloh and bring it up to the temple and pour wow. the water on the altar. And this was a water offering, water offering. and it was part of this prayer for rain. And hmm. there, it was supposed to be a it was a huge celebration in the Talmud. Uh, there's wonderful, wonderful um, descriptions of what the celebration looked like, singing and dancing, and and it was all around this idea of rain. And it and it connected very much with Yom Kippur because um, the part of this is celebrating the water and celebrating the festival and asking for the water. Um, but there's also one day on Sukkot that is set aside to be almost like a mini Yom Kippur, where your oh. prayers are more serious in the morning, mm -hmm. at least. And on that day, it's, it's, it's felt that that's when you do your maximum prayer, because it is on that day, um, whatever was wow. decided on Yom Kippur, it's kind of final, but we have like an exit. Okay, and that exit is that day on Sukkot where if you if you God decreed no water, you have another chance that you can say, <laughs> okay, we need the water, you know. <sighs> so all of that really is connected, you know, together. Right. Well, that was definitely what I experienced is coming in for Sukkot. You know, like you start with Rosh Hashanah, you go into Yom Kippur, which is really serious. You know, I think Rosh Hashanah has some elements of, of celebration, right. and stuff, but it also has some very serious elements because it's right. the beginning of the new year and it, you know, all that. Yom Kippur, definitely serious. And then uh, Sukkot is just Fun. happy time. Like it's a seven day party. Boy. and. You know, and it's a lot of just, you know, I mean, I remember coming into your sukkah and you always had people stopping by the house or you were going, you know, oh, we've got to go to this part, person's house and, and, and we've got to go to that one. And, you know, and it's just really a, a very community oriented, you know, seeing people and, and wishing everyone hug Samak and, you know, just really... Um, I don't know. It was it was a fun time to be in it. Was, it was it was a very festive, fabulous time to be in Israel. What do you think, Tommy? I I, I think um, oh, there's so much to this, but it it seems like to me then the what I enjoy and what I've seen here in the in the the Sukkot Feast of Tabernacles, and and I, I saw it in last week's portion. You know, that mm. this in, in Sandra being the. Uh, the, the Torah scholar here, but it says here, and this is interesting. It says in verse, uh, in chapter 28, verse uh, 47, it says, because you, it's just one verse here, but it's, it says a lot, because you did not serve the Lord with God, uh, Lord, your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. And he's talking about like the, um, you know, not thinking, God, not, not real and not, not showing joy. And I think that that's one of the things that, we, you know, we, I think we as Christians don't really understand. We talk about joy a lot. We talk about it, but for the mm -hmm. Jewish person, it's like, you, you better show joy. You know, <laughs> you gotta, like you're commanded, like it's a commandment. There's not going to be any sadness here. You're going to be, you're commanded to go into this feast and you better be happy. You know, it's like God <laughs> saying you better, you know, whatever you got, whatever issue you got, uh, let's deal with it. Obviously, during these days, even this month, and the, even the the ten days, and all of these things, we're leading up to this day, the these this week. It seems like to me, of just you know, you know, really just getting you know getting everything off of us, and and uh, being able to um, experience just real joy, you know, and. And I really appreciate it because when I'm, when I'm looking at the Jewish people around me, you know, because I'm here in Israel most of the time now in Sukkot. And boy, I just see that the guys mm -hmm. around here where I live, they take they take that joy part serious. They do. I mean, guys that you would talk to that would just have like, you know, real serious com theological conversations. Man. They are dancing like there's no tomorrow. They're doing, they're mm. just shaking the lulav and they're, and it's just like, they are, it's intense. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I really uh, uh, appreciate that. And, uh, and I think, you know, there, there's a lot to that because the, because the feast were, and I think that's one thing that we don't really understand. Uh, if you're not a farmer, I got to bring the right. farmer thing into it because, because yeah. it is an agricultural deal. 
you know, we walk into, uh, you know, Safeway or whatever grocery store. Uh, <laughs> we walk in there and there's always grapes, right? Right. Right. Always grapes. We're going like if there's no grapes, you know, it's like no, nobody's walking in the store. There's no grapes. Always going to be grapes. There, no matter what. Like grapes grow all year round in the grocery store. <laughs> uh, and it, you know, it's like this thing. But it's but it, I have it, to say it, one it, thing, though. I, I yeah. just realized this because when I was a kid growing up in the States, everything had a season. And in mm. Israel, everything has a season. You yeah. cannot get grapes in Israel all year. You can only get them That's in the summer. That's exactly right. Or you wow. have to pay really a lot. I don't get what happened really. in America since I left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it did. But 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 listen, when you were when you were growing the grape, you worked hard. You're you're you know the 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 locust didn't come. You're out there, and the and the yep. disease, the blight didn't didn't get the the fruit. And you're out there, and there's these gorgeous purple really red grapes, deep red mm -hmm. grapes growing out there. I'm telling you people, and they know what it means too, because that, yeah. that grape is going to produce the wine that for the weddings, for the, for the, for the celebrations, for every celebration is going to be mm -hmm. this thing. And, and um, it's funny because, you know, in, in Christianity, a lot of times there's a, even a, a you know, this prohibition against, right. you know, wine and things like that. Um, and I, and I always, I always appreciate the, you know, the, the, the God actually, you know, really created the, the grape itself because it's, it even has its own, uh, uh, you know, yeast that actually grows mm -hmm. on the grape as it's, it's no other fruit in the world does it. Right. So when the children of Israel, I can, I can see it. I, I, I'm experiencing, we've got over a hundred tons already picked by the wow. time this broadcast goes off, we're going to be, we'll probably be approaching 300 tons. Uh, wow. goes out. We're going to be 300 tons. And this year, a record deal, a miracle that we're here in the first place. But the fact that we're going to have a, just an abundance here um, during this season. And it's just the time that the, the, the Jewish people obviously would be celebrating because mm -hmm. the harvest is here and we've got an abundance of wine. We have an abundance of you know, all the other, you know, what are the fruits that came in during the summer, the apples, the, you know, the trees, the fruit, all this stuff's being brought to the, and they're, it's party time, you know, right. I mean, in a, in a holy sense, right. In a very holy sense. And, uh, and I, I think it's just exciting to me to read the, the, the word of God because it, because too, and I, and I like, because I think that Christianity, I hear a lot of Christians still saying this. Um, that, you know, that we don't, it's, it's not a feast that we need to, that we need to do. And I know Sandra says, well, you don't have to do it, Tom, you don't have to do it. But it says here that it's the feast of the Lord. It says it's a feast of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, for those of us who believe God, and I, and I think that we all agree here that God is, we worship the same God. You, mm -hmm. you work, we worship and we have different identities in that, in that worship and different processes in that worship. But the God, God of Israel is still the God of Israel. That's who we we're coming. And when we when were mandated to come uh, to Israel or to Jerusalem specifically, uh, and also too, it's not, uh, you know, you're asking about the Sukkot in Alaska or wherever, Canada, or wherever <laughs> these, you know, it's going to be one day, it's just going to be Jerusalem. Right, Sandra? right. I mean, right. it's just going to be, it's just going to be Jerusalem. Well, it's so going to be heaven. I think that that's going to be know, that, That's the the part that I think is that you know these feasts that God commanded, um, they're celebrating them in heaven because I think everything here on earth is a picture, is an image, it's a copy of what's up there, and so I think that they will continue like that. That it's it's a cycle. And even though heaven doesn't have harvest and, you know, it doesn't require ag require agriculturally, I think it's still a part of just human nature and just God. I don't know. I, th I, I think God celebrates Sukkot. What can I say? Well, you know what, Tommy, it interests me, though. Um, I, you've been here for many years now during the Feast of Tabernacles because it always falls right in the middle or towards the end of, of the grape harvest. But you must know people who are Christian who celebrate uh, the Feast of Tabernacles in some way uh, when they're, you know, in Europe or in America. 
What can you tell us about that? You know, is there some kind of Christian celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles that you're aware of? And what does it look like? Well, you know, it's funny because the I think that a lot of the um, state parks in the in in America now and all over the world probably are filling up with these Christians who are finding these parks and and then celebrating uh, their feast. Um, and to me, I think it's important, and I think I would, and I want to say this to the, the Christians that 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 what. Um, Kim read in the beginning here that the the those who don't come and celebrate the feast in Jerusalem, that we make sure that we know. Rabbi Malama told me years ago, he said, "Tommy, this is all rehearsal. We're all in rehearsal, and so you're 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 building your Sukkot in these places, but that's only the rehearsal that's going to happen in 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 Jerusalem. So I would like to you know say a lot of times that that what I see." is almost another replacement theology developing amongst Christianity in that, you know, just to make it a little bit heavy here, not always laughing about it, but, but, but there's a, there's a little bit of a, this replacement theology that's hitting the Christian community saying that, okay, we're going to bring Jerusalem to Albuquerque. You know, we're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to bring, uh, we're going to do Sukkot. And this is where the feast of tabernacles is going to be. And we're going to keep Torah and we're going to try to do this. And we're going to try to create our environment. And I think it's a very, it, it's important for us, I think, that if we want to do Sukkot and we want to build our sukkahs and we want to do it, you know, uh, you know, according to the Bible and all that, I think it's important for us to really remember that one day it's the, the nations are half together in Jerusalem. They have to gather with the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Albuquerque is never going to be the place <laughs> where, where God's going to, you know, where the Messiah is going to rule and reign. It's just not going to happen in Albuquerque. It's not going to happen there. And so we, we have to, we have, we have to be uh, aware of that and really just be looking at our, our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, to, to almost lead us in this direction. Uh, and and be mindful of it because we what we the last thing we we don't want to do is create another another replacement ideology right. or theology. So that that's my that that's my thought on it. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, well, I think it's it's relevant this? for now. But I, I hear a lot of people doing that. Hmm. Have Go you ahead. seen any uh, Feast of Tabernacle celebrations, Kim, in the United States? I have not personally seen them. I am aware. I know there's a couple of them, um, in different um, denominations. I think there's a huge one, maybe in Ohio or something, somewhere Midwest somewhere. But yeah, where it, they basically ha reserve an entire park, like a, a state park, and come in and just have like a week-long camping trip, basically. Because um, I think they don't even, and I think, I, I honestly, I haven't been there, so I don't, I don't know their theology. I don't know why they're doing it or where it's come from. Uh, but clearly, they're doing that. I, I love what you said, Tommy. It's a rehearsal. So as long as we remember that, hey, really, the real deal is in Jerusalem. The real deal is, you know, really just a, a representation of coming to the temple. And I, I love what you said, Sandra, about, you know, like bringing the water and, and just that whole part of it. Um, I don't think I knew that before, that, that they would have the whole um, ceremony, I guess, with the water. Uh, because that's, you know, water is life, you know, right. without water, nothing lives. So right, just right. Now, the symbolism there is just like mind blowing when you think about it. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, the, what, what I really thought of was um, like back the, the, the Native American, you know, the, the rain dances that they would do. And I was like, oh man, you know, maybe that's where they got it from. It is some ancient, ancient, you know, <laughs> remembrance back to the temple, back to when people were well, doing you know, the the idea of the, the need for rain um, is fundamental. And Absolutely. so there there were every single culture had some kind of ceremony for rain. Mm. But the the difference is in the rain dances that was a pagan ceremony. Right, of and, course. You know, and so in the in pagan cultures, there's a god of rain. 
or right. or, or you're praying to a mother nature or, or something you know it's of course a, a very different kind of thing but you know you're talking about something i just want to mention because this is this comes to mind now one a, a scripture that i just absolutely adore uh, that kind of connects you know god's protection on the land of israel with rain um in deuteronomy 11 verse 10 okay and here um it begins the section where god well it's part of moses is speaking to the nation preparing them that they're going into the land of israel and he says as follows for the land that you are about to enter and possess is not like the land of egypt from which you have come and we where there's a lot of contrast with egypt you know for all these Right. crazy things that Egypt is. But here we're going into a completely different element. Okay, there, the grain you sowed had to be watered by your own labors like a mm. vegetable garden, okay? But the land that you are about to cross into and possess, a land of hills and valleys, soaks up its water from the rains of heaven. Mm -hmm. um, now, and here I don't like the, I, I actually have to say, I do not like the translation. I'm going to retranslate it the way. <laughs> the sound of Mary's translation. No, no, no. They're missing the point by the when I read the English. Okay, it says like this: There, uh, okay, there, the grain you sowed had to be watered with your feet, mm. not by your labors, with your feet, mm. like a vegetable garden. Okay, but the land you are about to enter. Uh, soak up its waters from the rains of heaven. So what does that mean? Egypt, I mean, it's well known. Egypt's water comes from the Nile. Right. And literally, the water comes from where your feet are, okay? The, right. What they would do is they would build canals from the Nile into the fields. And to so irrigate. literally, in the, way you're, in the way you walk, you yeah. know, the, the water would come the way you walk, through your feet kind of thing, mm -hmm. okay? As opposed to in the land of Israel, we have to... It, we get it from the heaven. Now watch the next land, okay? It is a land which the Lord your God looks after and which the Lord your God always keeps his eye from year's beginning to year's end. Now let's connect those two verses, okay? When you have to rely on rain, that means the rain is coming from the heavens, right? Right. Literally, that means that if you need rain, you're not looking at your feet. You're looking right. to the heavens. Yeah. You're praying to God to bring rain. And at the same time, the next verse says, it is a land that God has his eyes upon it every mm. single day of the year. So all of this, you know, this is this is what the land of Israel is all about. This is how Moses has de defined the land of Israel, a land with very special protection. But he is using this, this image of water to explain. And here, what he's done is he's connected the type of water and the issue of water in the land of Israel with God's protection. And then you also have to deserve the rain. You have right. to pray for the rain. And it's all part of God's special protection over the land of Israel. And so when we talk about all these things we talked about with the water and praying for the water and rejoicing in the water that happens in the Feast of Tabernacles, in a way, it's represented in these verses um, where it just describes what the land of Israel is. So I would have to agree with you, Tommy. And I feel this way, you know, like we said at the beginning, Jews have been celebrating all these holidays regardless of where they were. There's a very famous, there's a very famous commentary um, about the nature of a Jewish observance of all of the commandments uh, mm. outside the land of Israel. And there's a very ancient commentary that comes back from, I don't know, first or second century. And then a more, uh, someone, a very famous commentator named Nachmanides from uh, the Middle Ages focused and, and kind of has his own spin on that. But it basically says as follows. He says, really, all the commandments are really only supposed, they're meant for the land of Israel. And we can see the festivals. They're around the climate. Mm -hmm. They're around the agricultural season. They, they fit with the land of Israel. They don't fit in Canada. Right in Paris, <laughs> right. Or okay. But what he says is the reason, um, the reason we are keeping the commandments uh, all, all over the world is so that we they become like signposts, okay? Mm. Signposts so that we will know the way back, back. Wow, okay. Signposts wow. to know the way back, and that's like what you talked about, Tommy, being uh, a dress rehearsal. 
Uh, yeah. Jews as well, it was for us, we knew not just, you're talking about a dress rehearsal and, and some after, you know, whatever, heavenly time, whatever. But this was, the Jews themselves physically have to come back to the land of Israel. And mm -hmm. they're going to come back to the land of Israel and celebrate these holidays, but they need to remember what to do. Right. You know, right. and we have to keep those traditions as an unbroken tradition so that we come back to the land, we're doing the right thing. And I feel this so so strongly personally because um all these holidays that we celebrated growing up in cleveland um and then coming to israel suddenly realizing it we didn't know the half of it you right know, right the, the celebration the fitting in with the season the fact that the whole country you know when we celebrate the feast of tabernacles so we put out uh, up our little sukkah in our backyard um you know the non-jews that looked at us said mm, what are they doing? What are they there? doing? <laughs> right. What's going on? You know? So here, it like you said, Kim, everybody's doing it. It's every apartment, of, every every balcony is a sukkah. Every, balcony, every restaurant, yeah. every street corner, there's a sukkah. I mean, it's they're everywhere. Else, I don't know if you realize this, but Jews, Orthodox Jews, who are particularly careful to make sure they can observe every detail of a commandment, not just when it's convenient, okay? That when they're buying apartments. You know, right. with balcony, every apartment as well as a balcony. That's right. just standard. But when they buy an apartment with a balcony, they make sure that they have at least one balcony off of their apartment that is not covered by another uh, balcony. Oh, because okay. if it's covered by another balcony, it's like but, a ceiling. Right. You know, right. Right. Okay. And that's why I don't know if any of you have noticed, if you look at nope. Israel, apartment buildings all over the country have staggered balconies. That's so that why. at least there's one balcony or at least part of a balcony of every apartment that is open, open to, to the, the sky. sky. Wow. You won't see that anyway. I mean, the building industry in <laughs> Israel is accommodating Sukkot. You know, <laughs> amazing. Love it. Good. Love it. <laughs> yeah, and it's amazing. Nowhere else. That is amazing. Um, yeah, and I, I want to just say, too, that... Um, you know, for you know, a majority, I think, I believe the majority of people listening to the to the program here are Christians, and it's important for us to, as Christians, to understand that Jesus also kept the feast. Uh, you know, it was a, the, that that uh, it was something that he did as a Jew, as a, as as a Jew, and and one that really attracts us. You know, the two. Uh, these things, and uh, but he, but it's interesting that the, his uh, discussion or teachings was was a lot about water, and mm -hmm. I would tell a, a Christian audience to go to John chapter seven and just read that because it's a you know he's yeah he's a re a religious Jew you know so uh, so I think it's uh, important for us as as Christians to connect with the this holiday particularly this holiday because of what the prophet Zechariah says. Uh, but, you know, even as we're, you know, claiming to follow our rabbi that, you know, you know he's he also gives us an example of, of, of celebrating the feast. So uh, so I just I, I would encourage, uh, you know, it's not some, you know, Sandra's not pushing something on us here that we, you know, <laughs> that we haven't seen. But we should be knowing about this. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, where is the church out there? Or, and I think I see more of them uh, mm -hmm. recognizing it. Uh, and more pastors speaking about it, which is good. Still, I think that we have a long way to go, and I think that we have to, um, you know, look at the at the at the Bible, the entirety of the Bible, and we need to we need to uh, be thankful. I'm so thankful uh, because if the Jewish people had not kept these the these biblical commandments, if they had not kept their identity. Uh, we would not have this, where, where would we go? You know, how right. would we fulfill, uh, you know, Zechariah 14? How would we, how would we fulfill it? Okay. Where it says here that we're supposed to go to Jerusalem, but where the Jews aren't there. So how are we going to, you know, what, who's setting up this whole thing? I'm very thankful, uh, that the Jewish people kept the oracles of God. Uh, they kept them yeah. very, very, um, you know, um, seriously, uh, every every jot and tittle, we 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 see that word in the in the New Testament too. I mean, just every, I mean, it's so the we could degree. probably talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to see the scribes and how serious yeah. they are in writing the scriptures and making sure, and it's amazing too. Sandra's told told us before 
about, uh, you know, finding scrolls in synagogues from all over the world and how perfectly matched they are. How, how could that happen? Where's the telephone game game in this thing? You know, you can't, it's not, it's like, doesn't Thank exist. God. It's like, wow, that's it. That's an incredible thing. And uh, so I think that we as Christians have very much to be thankful for um, and, and thankful in this, in this festival, this festival of God in which he's calling us, it seems like all, all the world together to celebrate. And it's not just a, it's not just a Jewish thing. Absolutely. It's uh it's, it's, it's for all of us. So um, I'm very, very thankful for that. Well, Sandra, tell us about Simchat Torah, because that is what, the last day of Sukkot or the day after Sukkot? It's and I, I just love Su Simchat Torah was one of my favorite holidays, going to the synagogue. And I mean, you talk about a party, you talk, and, and the basis yeah. of the party, though, you know, like, the, like, man, we don't have this in Christian churches. I'm sorry. I, no, I love no. church. I love pastors, yeah. but we do not have. And we can, well, we you can haven't been well to the charismatic to churches that I've been to, you know. You well, know. I have, but that's what <laughs> I grew up in. But man, so what is Simchat yeah. Torah? If they could just get that, man, that would be great. Oh. Okay, well, Simchat Torah is actually um, in the Bible. It's called the uh, eighth, the festival of the eighth day, or something oh. like that. Okay, um, and it is. Uh, you'll see it on. Um, See, uh, Leviticus 23, verse uh, 16, verse 15, verse, verse, oh, excuse me, I'm reading this wrong. Verse 34 starts talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, about Sukkot, and verse 35 talks about the first day. And then on verse 36, uh, it says seven days you're going to celebrate, talks about a certain offering you bring. And on the eighth day, that is like almost a separate holiday. In other words, Sukkot right. itself is seven days, but latched onto it and connected to it is this eighth day, which is called um, a solemn gathering. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. It's a festival, a festival of the eighth day. So that's how it began. Uh, it's kind of like an addendum that was there. <laughs> um, and it, it's on that day that you pray for the rain. Okay, ah, so right. if during the seven days you brought the rain, you brought the water from the Shiloh up to the temple. It's on the eighth day that you pray for the rain. For the rain. Okay, now, um, but later on, it's a later edition, the Simchat Torah. Mm. Uh, and what, and it was just added to the same time, same day, although mm. actually it's a little complicated, so you don't have to understand this. But uh, in outside of Israel, holidays are an extra day. Right. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do a whole program on that. That's, That's a good one. <laughs> right. No, it's not a whole program. I mean, just, just very, very quickly. In ancient times, they didn't have a calendar. So they would declare the first of the month by looking at the moon. Uh, it just took longer for the word to get to Babylon. Uh, right. when, when was the new moon? So they just added an extra day because they weren't really sure when the first day of the month was. So it could have been the first or the second day. So. That's in, in Troy. But anyway, whatever. In Israel, those two days are the same day, the Shemini Atzeret that we know from the Bible, and adds this element of it called Simchat Torah, which literally means rejoicing in the Torah. And this really goes back to the reading of the Torah portions. Uh, and, you know, we have an annual cycle now where uh, we begin with Genesis right after the Feast of Tabernacles. And in one year, we finish the five books of Moses. Now, actually... In ancient times, in the land of Israel, uh, and it's believed that the, first, the this custom to read the Torah portion every week in the synagogue began with Ezra, okay? And um, at that time, the custom in the land of Israel was to read it over a three-year cycle, okay? S at some point, in some countries, and it ended up being everywhere, but I think it began in North Africa, actually, uh, they changed that custom, and instead of being a... Um, three-year cycle, it was a one-year cycle. And so when they had that one-year cycle, if they began Genesis, the first Shabbat, after the Feast of Tabernacles, they finished the Torah on the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. So that last day of the holiday is when we actually, we saved the last portion, the portion of the Zotah Bracha, the, the um, blessings that Moses gives to the nation wow. before he dies. And then it ends, of course, with his death. 
those last chapters are saved and read uh, mm -hmm. in the synagogue on Simchat Torah. Uh, and it is a special celebration of having completed the Torah. Right. Uh, as you said, Kim, a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, but it's dancing with the Torah scrolls. The men right. uh, take the Torah scrolls in some more liberal congregations. The women also will hold the Torah scroll and they'll dance. Um, yep. I mean, women and men are dancing separately, but, you know, dancing around, singing songs, uh, rejoicing in the fact that God has given us mm -hmm. this Torah. His written um, word. It's, it's amazing. Right. And it's, it's amazing. It's just very special. And what's really nice is, on the one hand, it's a cycle that begins and ends, but it is a cycle so that it keeps going. Right. And that is represented because on Simchat Torah, when they read the last chapter of the of the Bible, there is a there's a special singing and honoring. Somebody there there somebody is honored to to go up and say the blessings over the Torah for that last chapter. Mm. Those last few words, uh, of few verses of the. Um, of the Deuteronomy, Torah. yeah, he, right, and he reads it, and then immediately thereafter, somebody else is honored to come up, and they read the first chapter of Genesis. So <laughs> that even though we then read again the first chapter of Genesis the following right. Shabbat, but the idea being, don't think you finished, okay? Right, you're done. <laughs> but <laughs> not my time card. Immediately <laughs> start again, and then you start with, with Genesis again. So. All of this is part of this amazing celebration of the Torah itself. And whereas on Shavuot, on Pentecost, we celebrate the actual giving of the Ten Commandments. Um, and that is a more spiritually uplifting kind of thing. Um, on Simchat Torah, it's a very just joyful human celebration uh, of the fact that we have appreciated the Torah, have we studied the Torah, and the Torah has become part of our lives it's it's a much more down to earth kind of celebration of what Torah means to us uh, in our in our daily lives and in in, in studying of, of the Torah. So yeah, it's a great it's a great great holiday. I, I think one, one, of the, one of the things that, that the um, oh. did I, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, uh, I think there's a little bit of delay. I think one of the things that the the in the Christian community that we get I, I hear a lot. They may go through a cycle or they may go through a, a uh, you know, reading the Bible through and, and they really don't understand that part about Jews every year reading the same five books. And it's like, you know what? I got it the first time or I got it the second time I got it, uh, you know, and it's funny. I, it's, it's really kind of um, strange. But I, you know, since I've been doing it, I, I've been, you know, reading the portion. I love reading the portion. I love getting the, the, uh, you know, your teaching, Sandra, and, and so many other teaching teachers that I'm around up here, here uh, in Israel. And, and, but the, the Torah, it's never, it seems like it changes every single year, the message That's that right. I get from the particular portion. And I just encourage people, the Bible is, it, what is it, 70 what is it? Is it 70 faces or the Torah yeah. or something like that? 70 the 70. Yeah. So it's like, OK, so if the 70 years of my life, I'm going to get a different face of this particular right. passage here. And, it, and, right. and it's never and it's never going to be the same. It's going to be something new. And, and, and I and I really uh, it's always fresh. That. It's like water. It's, it's always, always fresh. fresh. It's, it's, it's always oh, yeah. new. It's, it's never yeah. old, boring or dull. Yeah, I and I and I, every time I hear a teacher uh, teach on the the portion or whatever, and and, and even the, it's just a real there's an intensity of a lo the love for God's word because this is really, uh, you know, what God breathed. He, yeah. you know, we, again we go back to Genesis. Christians don't have a problem believing God breathed that, you know, the first <laughs> couple of chapters anyway. They got a problem when it gets to Genesis twelve. Uh, then, you know, then it starts going, well, did God really say that kind of, you know, did he, did he really say this is the land I'm going to give your descendants? But the reality is, is all of God's word is powerful. It's, 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 it, it, it has that same creative, you know, universe power out of all of his word. Uh, and, and we have got to, I think, embrace that as people created by God. Uh, to worship him. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's important for us to be reminded of that. And the way, 
uh, your love for the word demonstrated in that holiday is su such a testimony. And I, for me, uh, a testimony to for the, the just the love of, uh, yeah. you know, Christians just they they kind of snarl or I've seen people that, you know, st stop it. Why don't we need to be loving the word of God? Uh, you know, we need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. We need to be challenged to love God's word. Um, like some of our Jewish people, you know, I know there's not every, there's uh, not all the Jews are righteous and not all the Jews are doing everything perfect. Hey, but Tommy, I, I got a newsflash. Not all the Christians are doing exactly. it right either. <laughs> no, we, we have, we have our problems and we won't, we won't talk about people. that. Sandra. People are people. Sandra's never, she, Sandra's not seen that side of Christianity. You know, she thinks <laughs> we're all <perfect. laughs> Uh, no, I think yeah. it's just awesome and amazing. And, you know, it's always been, I think for me coming to Israel, um, just the open atmosphere of coming and join us, even though you're not Jewish, even though, you know, you don't have a clue what's going on and these aren't necessarily your traditions or history. Um, for me as a Christian, I always felt very warm, very welcome, very come in and be a part of this because it, it is the God's word is for every single human being across the planet and you can take part in this. And it's, it's not a, uh, an exclusive community, you know, like you're an outsider. We don't want you in there. It was always very much come in and be a part of us. And I just, I, I love that part about Sukkot. In that, in and the about light Israel of that, in general. I got I got to I got to have a question for you, Sandra, because uh -oh. <laughs> obviously we are living in different times. What, yeah. you know, I, I've been here in Harbor Akha and we, we take our guys, we go sukkah sitting. What is the virus and what is the Corona world mm. going to do to oh, the, oh, to, to the, so to the feast? First of all, I have to tell you, I just was all of a sudden, I, I said this to my husband a few days ago. I said, for the first time in more than 20 years, I am not going to have Christian visitors in my sukkah. There's no tourism. There's no right, tourism. Right, there's there's no no tourism. Here. No Every one. year I had this 10 people, 10 people here, 50 people. I would have, there were some days during mm. the holiday that I would have three, four groups almost coming in like a railroad in and out of my sukkah. <laughs> and I would have, my neighbors would, would hear, would listen. You know, they would say, we said, listen, we heard what was going on. You know, it was just amazing. And and that's just not happening this year. Um, and, and just within our own communities, um, people are not socializing as much. Mm. We're not in general. So we're not inviting each other. We're, we're very hesitantly, one or two people at a time, out sitting outside, you know, mm. And, and it's it's just, it's and we were just talking about Simchat Torah, like this past Shabbat. All of a sudden I have to say, what are we going to do? You can't dance around. You can't hold right. hands. You can't. I mean, mm. what, what are we going to do? And someone was saying, well, I guess we'll just stand each in our own, you know, two meter whatever and, and <laughs> clap our hands. I mean, I cannot. And, and the, it's mm. limited. Everything is just going to be awful. And I we're going to have to figure out how to make the best of it. But. Uh, going back again to my husband, Ed, he has said some beautiful things recently. And he said, we're just going to pretend this year didn't happen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I just think that's how we're, we're just going to get through it the best we get can. And then we're going to erase it. it and then we're going to we're going to appreciate so much more when it's all over. <laughs> right, Amen. Right. Absolutely. Amen. And I guess this is a, a wonderful opportunity to just, I would say, let's wish everybody out there, however you celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and if you've never even heard of it before, um, we want to just wish everybody health at, at this very difficult time that we are in. Good health, mm -hmm. uh, stay safe. You know, if this year you're not going to be able to get together with everybody, it's okay. You need to look after your health first, and and uh, hopefully next year we'll be celebrating everybody in Israel. <laughs> Isn't that what they say? Amen, oh, that's amen. Passover. Next year in Jerusalem. Well, we could say it this year too. You that's know, right. next year, Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. Right now, put it on your calendar. Come to Israel. You can't Absolutely. do it this year. I okay. really hope that we'll see you all next year. And you're invited to my sukkah. <laughs> Hag Sameach, right? Okay. Bye, bye bye. Come help in the harvest. <laughs>